So I'm Bo Ewald. I kind of grew up in graphics and high performance computing with uh, your parents generally and uh, have been doing it for a long, long time and uh, have had a lot of fun at it. I've been helping D-Wave for about the last three years. D-Wave is the world's first commercial quantum computing company and so we'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, sort of three things though. This really is I don't know if it's disruptive, but it's really different technology, different than anything that, that I've bumped into in probably being in this business for 40 years one way or another. Really different. Uh, second thing to remember is we grew our customer base 50% last year. We went from two customers to three. And so it's very early days. Uh, Los Alamos joined us as our third customer, joining Lockheed and Google. Then uh, in December of last year, one more step in showing the potential of quantum computing. Uh, Google learned some more about the machine over the last couple of years and created another synthetic optimization benchmark to put on our machine, ran it, ran it against tradi a traditional Intel-based server, and the D-Wave machine, saw, again, synthetic benchmark tailored to do well on this machine, was 100 million times faster than it was on a conventional system. That's a pretty big number. The actual number was 180 million, but they rounded it down to, to 100. So, but very early days, um, we're, we need really more pioneers, to more smart people to use, think about these machines, how do you apply them, how do you create software tools for them. So it's sort of like 1955 in traditional computing or something like that. Um, our quantum computer and other quantum computers as they come along over the next 10 to 20 years, rather than fighting against quantum effects as today's traditional systems do, we try to harness those quantum effects. And so uh, this is sort of the set of three things that in traditional computers you typically fight against at the electronics level or, or have, have to fight against the quantum part of it in that in our traditional worlds we're binary. Bits are zeros or ones, period. That's what we want them to be. Bits and words are separable. They don't become sort of entangled, so they become one unit. And then when we hit a barrier, whether it's a barrier on a device or whether we're doing an optimization, a search, we have to climb over the barrier to get to the other side. In the quantum world, we're exploiting these three things. And the first <clears throat> is that in our world, bits are, as predicted in quantum mechanics, they're a zero or a one or both. It's actually a zero and a one and both. We use entanglement, where if we're, through clever engineering, able to get our systems so that the qubits, the quantum bits, become entangled, rather than operating in a separable manner as 10 individual bits here, if they become entangled, you have to treat them them as one unit, and they operate as one unit. And then the last is quantum tunneling, in which when we come to a barrier, we tunnel through to a lower energy level. So those are the three things that we're using in, uh, <clears throat> in building the D-Wave machine. Way to think about it is that rather than adding and subtracting and shifting left and shifting right, if you can transform your problem into an energy landscape, mountains and valleys, here it's three dimensions, but it's really an n-dimensional energy landscape. This machine, about 10,000 times a second, will find the lowest valley or valleys in that energy landscape, probably. Another difference, it's probabilistic. So we don't guarantee that it's the correct or the best answer, but what we do then in our world is rather than running a simulation once, you'll run it 10 times or 100 or 1,000 and look at the distribution of results. Fairly low precision, just four or five bits of precision as you specify this energy landscape, so that's another difference. And we solve this complete problem. We're looking at now with 1,000 qubits, which is our, the system we're fielding today, um, the search space, the minimization space, searches through a space of two to the 1,000th potential solutions to find the lowest valley or valleys in this energy landscape. This is what they look like. There are actually three systems here. The, the computer, the chip itself, is just a chip. It's about the size of your fingernail, but it comes in a box, which basically is a skiff for those of you who have been in the classified world. And so it's a big box, and it's intended to 
cut out any radio frequency interference, magnetism, uh, it needs to be on a vibrationless floor, all those things and others to be able to get it to operate in a quantum manner. So, so mostly air inside, and over time these of course will get smaller. If you opened it up, you would see in fact that there looks like a can, it's sort of like these, the Russian dolls that are stacked inside the other, where if you remove those at each level, the cans are connected to a gold disc there, and you can see that we go from liquid nitrogen temperature down to a uh, particular type of liquid helium temperature. The machines today are running at about 15 millikelvin, which is pretty cold. It's a lot colder than it is in interstellar space, and we do that so that they'll be superconducting, and in fact, so that we can get them uh, to use, to operate in a quantum manner. So they look quite different in at the sort of the bottom level of that terminator arm there uh, is a chip, and this is the chip itself. Won't belabor quantum bits and stuff. Maybe some other year we can come and you know, talk a little bit more about all the technology in detail, or we're glad to. We have an evolving but rudimentary uh, software environment. We're building it up fairly quickly and building on things that we have um, pioneered in uh, traditional computing. At the bottom is a QMI, or a quantum machine instruction. Uh, this machine is a uh, very long instruction word computer. You basically put that whole energy model into the one instruction. And it is a really, really, really reduced instruction set computer because there only is one instruction. We have thought of maybe a second instruction that we might invent, but it's, you know, it's pretty simple to think of there. The challenge is, not learning how to program it, but how do you translate a real-world problem onto it. Looks like it'll be good for certain types of optimization problems. Google's machine is, was purchased for their efforts in machine learning and moving on to deep learning. And then it looks like it will also be good at sampling or Monte Carlo sorts of applications. And the software environment is evolving, uh, so we have some things that not certainly not up to the level of compilers yet. We're just calling them translators. They're prototype software to try to translate from a language that a subject matter expert might speak into this quantum machine instruction. And we've also picked up virtualization. Uh, and so now you can create an intermediate representation of the problem that's larger than the physical hardware, and then we can map that onto, uh, onto the hardware itself. This was a Google benchmark from about two and a half years ago. Won't go through the details of it, but they wanted to compare the D-Wave results, the D, this, a set of optimization problems on D-Wave compared to IBM Cplex and others other commercial off-the-shelf optimization packages. The D-Wave results are shown in red, timing chart, so faster is, uh, lower, lower down the chart is better. And in fact, you would see as the problems got up to using 500 qubits, which was the size of the machine we had at that point, we were about 10,000 times faster, so that gave Google hope that in fact if you could tailor a problem onto the machine, you could get good performance. The second thing they, they and we did was work for about six months to see if you could train it to recognize a car in a set of training images they had. And lo and behold, we were able to do that and got a little better results. We were able to identify a car about nine, accurately out of this set of training. Uh, images about 94% of the time compared to 84% of the time of the software they gave us to benchmark against. But more importantly for them, they used the D-Wave machine to train the classical machine, took the D-Wave results back onto the classical machine and ended up using only about a third of the CPU cycles on the classical machine to get a slightly better result. And at the time, Google Glass was driving it, which was a battery-operated computer. And the last thing is these most recent results from Google. You can find these things on the Google blog, and they've been publicized many, many places. But again, for an optimization program tailored for the D-Wave machine, turned out to be about 100 million times faster than on a traditional machine using just one core. So that's, they, they decided to do that. So they've learned a lot in a couple of years about where this machine might fit. With that, would answer 39 seconds worth of questions. Uh, we're roughly doubling the number of qubits every 18 to 24 months or so. Any questions for Bo about D-Wave quantum? It's really weird and wild stuff, and we'll see you around at various places. So, great. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Bo.